good morning to everybody from California. Um, Labas vakaras for those of you in Lithuania and Dobry vietur, and I'm not sure I'm gonna get all the languages, but you know, for all of you in Eastern Europe, thanks for joining in your evening. Um, so yeah, so I'm Randy Schaup, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about minimal viable architecture. So this is the uh, maybe um, a life cycle of a company or a product, like most things that we do follow this sort of S curve um, here. So we're gonna start off slow if we're lucky. And we'll talk about that. We might be scaling really fast and then things will tend to level off at the end. And what I, the structure of this talk is about trying to figure out what's the appropriate software architecture to have at the different phases of our company. And also to try to um, actually maybe even before that, kind of recognize what phase we're in to help us uh, figure out what's the appropriate um, architecture to have. Um, so a bit of my background, super briefly, um, I spent a bunch of time at some big companies, Google and eBay, um, and then more recently I worked at smaller companies that were in the beginning parts of that scaling phase, um, like Stitch Fix and WeWork. So all this that I'm trying to say here are basically mistakes that I've made, I guess. Um, and uh, so hopefully you can learn from the things and instead of uh, making the same mistakes, you can make different in your own mistakes. Um, the genesis of this talk was uh, comes from a time after I'd left Google and eBay where I was doing some consulting. Um, and I get a bunch of you know small startups that say, oh, this is so great. You worked at Google and eBay, these big successful places. Tell us how you did everything. And I, my answer would be, sure, I'll be happy to tell you all the things that we did, but you have to promise not to do them. Um, and that's not because Google and eBay did things wrong, but because Google and eBay were doing things right for them. Um, you know, at the time when I left Google, there were maybe 15,000 engineers at the company. Now I understand there are 50,000, 50,000 engineers. Um, and so most of the startups that I was talking with were maybe five engineers. So that's 10,000 X you know, difference in scale. Um, and so the things that work at Google scale are definitely not appropriate in the same way as the stuff that would not work for the five person startup, there's no way that would work for Google. The reverse is also true. And so that's a bit the theme that we're gonna see across this whole, um, this whole talk. Um, so I, I like to give these stories of just these big successful companies, um, basically because it shows how they have all evolved over time. And I think it gives you a sense of um, choosing the appropriate architecture at the appropriate time. Um, so eBay, uh, depending on how you count, is on its fifth complete rewrite of its infrastructure. So it started as a monolithic Perl application that the founder uh, wrote in a three-day weekend in 1995, and he never intended it to be a company or even anything serious, but he wrote this little thing in Perl uh, on, his, uh, uh, on his machine, machine at home for three days, um, and then that was the, the seed that became eBay. The next iteration was this monolithic C++ uh, uh, situation where at its height, it, be, it was 3.4 million lines of code in a single ISAPI DLL. So that was, you know, if you think you have a monolith, like they definitely had one. Um, the next iteration was breaking the site up into about 200 different Java applications um, where one would be responsible for selling parts of the site, the other part would be buying parts of the site, search, et cetera, times you know, 200 different applications that together made up eBay. And now it's fair to call eBay a polyglot set of microservices. Twitter has gone through a similar evolution. So it's on its maybe third generation. It started famously as the world's biggest Ruby on Rails app. Um, then they started pulling out the front end into mostly uh, a lot of JavaScript, a bunch of backend uh, services out into, uh, or into backend services, mostly written in Scala. And now it's fair to characterize Twitter as a polyglot set of microservices. Um, Amazon has gone through a similar evolution. So uh, it started as a monolithic Perl and C++ hybrid. Um, so hugely, huge monolith um, that was still running Amazon through the year 2000. Um, so Amazon was already a household name and they were running on this uh, massive monolith. Um, Amazon spent the year, essentially spent the years 2000 to 2005 completely rebuilding their infrastructure and architecture on um, 
uh, software uh, of uh, service oriented architecture principles. Now we would probably call that microservices. We didn't have that word then, um, but they spent those five years essentially not making a bunch of new features, um, but completely retooling their architecture. And anybody who's been paying attention uh, since 2005, I mean, Amazon is taking over the world of retail and computing and all sorts of stuff. So if, any, if you take nothing else away from this talk, uh, architecture matters, right? The, uh, the effort that Amazon spent during those five years retooling their architecture to be more flexible really paid off for them in the, in the last uh, 15 years. And now it's fair to, care, to call Amazon uh, a polyglot set of microservices. So it seems like there are some patterns here. Um, one of the patterns is that nobody starts with microservices. Like none of these companies started building a distributed system. They all evolved their way to it. Um, and past a certain scale, and I underline those words very, uh, very uh, intentionally, past a certain scale, all these large scale companies do end up with something which we could now call microservices. But I do want to caution that most of us are never going to reach the scale of an eBay or an Amazon or a Google. And so um, applying those principles uh, or applying the techniques that work at eBay and Google and Amazon scale is not appropriate uh, for maybe the vast majority uh, of companies. Um, so, so let's, so let's um, walk through these phases as we, as we go along here. Um, so uh, first we'll talk, I'll talk briefly about the idea phase. Uh, then I wanna talk about the starting phase, uh, then how we do scaling, um, and then finally what I'll call the optimizing phase. So in the idea phase, the biggest uh, question that you wanna ask yourself is what problem you're trying to solve. So this, when I mean an idea phase, this is spinning up a new project within some larger organization, or maybe starting your own startup where you know, everything's a blank slate. But the key thing is you don't yet have, um, you're still trying to figure out what you're gonna do and whether the thing you think you're gonna do is actually going to solve the problem. So the reason to start with the problem statement is, is this. So Peter Drucker, who's a famous management guru in the United States says, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. It's important to focus on and characterize the problem that we're trying to solve uh, before we even try to figure out how to do it. Um, so at this, at this phase, at this idea phase, we really don't want to have much of an architecture at all. So the way I like to think about it is we want to have a prototype architecture. And let's say what our goal is at this, at this stage. Our goal is to explore the problem space, try to figure out what we're, what we're doing here, but as rapidly as, and as cheaply as possible. So let's find a business model, let's find product market fit, and let's see if anybody's willing to pay for it or, or it's useful, or if you're in a company, is it useful for other, other people? Are they gonna use it? Um, and so the main thing that we want out of this uh, phase is we wanna be able to rapidly iterate. And everything that we build at this phase is a prototype which we absolutely should plan to throw away. So um, we really shouldn't be thinking about building for the long term. We're just trying to explore this idea to see if there's anything, anything here. Uh, and ideally, at this phase, we shouldn't be using any technology at all. Um, probably a lot of you have worked with user experience uh, folks that do paper prototypes. So you would draw maybe what the interactions would be and do a bunch of stuff on paper. Why do we do that? We do that because it allows us, it's a sort of 80-20 rule. It allows us to explore the ideas without spending a lot of time investing in building those ideas. And that is a hugely powerful technique in order to figure out whether what, what problem we're solving and whether the solutions that we think will work will actually actually will work. Um, one of the great examples in the uh, Lean Startup book, which is where I got the you know minimal viable architecture phrasing from, was uh, is um, doing fake Google ads. So let's imagine that I want to do online delivery of pet food or something like that. What I could buy some Google ads, you know, that are about online pet food delivery and see if anybody clicks on them. See if there's a way of exploring the demand for this product that I'm thinking of building without actually building anything. Um, uh, Stitch Fix in the United States right now is known for using a huge amount of data science and machine learning to figure out what kinds of clothes people are going are gonna to like. And there's a ton of sophistication uh, uh, around that right now. 
but the original start of uh, Stitch Fix was an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, the founder literally in her business school, you know, dorm room, uh, put together a spreadsheet of factors she thought that would predict uh, whether people would like clothes or not. Um, and that was the start of, uh, start of Stitch Fix. Um, also starting things for in, in, through a blog or just through a web page. Anyway, the point here is that we really, at this stage, we want, want to explore the problem space as opposed to building technology. And the way I like to think about and it, sometimes for engineers that like makes us feel weird, but the way I like to think about it is engineering is about solving problems and only sometimes do we solve those problems by writing code. Okay. Uh, so that was the idea phase. Let's move on to, uh, to the starting phase. So um, at the starting phase, we probably have one team. So maybe we're a bunch of people that can all fit around a conference table or maybe a small number of people that can fit around a set of Zooms for the uh, current situation. Um, we, and we, we really don't have that much uh, runway. So we're just starting out. We don't know that we're gonna be around for two years or five years or 10 years. So it makes absolutely no sense for us to build for a future that we don't know is gonna, is gonna happen. Rather, we should be thinking about what are things that we can do in the very near term to make a uh, near term progress toward uh, finding customers and then, um, and then um, uh, make, making them like what we do. Um, so at this at this stage, we want very, we want a very small team, and so people are probably familiar with this idea of the two pizza team. Uh, actually, credited to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, and he says a team should be no larger than can be fed by two large pizzas. So maybe depending on how much pizza you eat, uh, maybe that's four people or six people or something like that. But it's definitely not uh, much larger than that. Um, and so at this phase, what we want is what I like to say, it's just enough architecture, the bare amount of architecture to uh, get the job done. And our goal here is to meet those near term evolving customer needs as, uh, as cheaply and simply as possible. So we want to uh, delight the first customers that are trying out our new product or our new you know, application, and we want to acquire more. Uh, and the thing we want to optimize for is rapid learning and rapid improvement based on uh, customer usage and customer feedback. Uh, we want to opt, we have a really small team and we're trying to do a lot. Um, so we want to optimize for our team productivity. What we absolutely do not want to optimize for at this case, is, at this situation, at this phase is scaling, because that is not our problem yet. It might be if we should be so lucky that we will have a scaling problem in the future, but at this phase, we absolutely don't have one yet. So we should be, we should be uh, employing simple and familiar technology to our team. So this is not the time for us to try out new technology that nobody's familiar with. Um, rather, we wanna choose technology that gives us a bunch of expressive power and a bunch of ease of use for the developers. And so this is why, this is obvious probably in retrospect, but this is why a lot of early stage companies choose frameworks like Ruby on Rails or PHP. It's not because those things are best for all phases of a uh, company, um, but they are, they do, they are um, particularly good uh, at, at rapid prototyping. Um, and that's what, uh, what's really needed at this very early stage uh, of our evolution. So we absolutely want at this stage to have a monolithic architecture. There's nothing shameful about this at all. We probably have a single application that's over a single database. Uh, and we really don't want to have any infrastructure at all. So ideally in the modern world, if we could do things with serverless, if we could do things with platforms as a service, really this, this is not the time for us to be spending a lot of time building infrastructure. Um, so our architecture might look something like this, you know, so we'll have a presentation tier, which is maybe I don't know, iOS or Android or, uh, or JavaScript in the web. Uh, we might have an application tier that's built with one of those rapid prototyping frameworks and we're probably on one database. Very simple architecture and it, it should meet our needs at this phase. Um, so as with every uh, architecture, there are trade-offs. And so we have pros to this and, and also some cons. So uh, pros of the monolithic architecture is it's really simple at first. It's simple for us to get started. Uh, all the latencies within our application are all in process. So it's really fast for us to call from one part of the application to another. Um, it's typically a, typically a single build unit, single deployment unit and uh, rather than building things with tens or hundreds of individual services, it's actually very resource efficient at small scale. 
Um, so people who've worked with monolithic architectures for a long time will, will have uh, seen that there are cons to the monolithic architecture over time. Um, so as our team grows, the coordination overhead becomes more difficult. Um, monolithic architectures don't enforce modularity or componentization particularly well. I mean, we can do that through discipline in our development process, but there's nothing about the monolith that makes it easy for us to do that um, by itself. Um, it doesn't uh, lend itself very well to horizontal scaling of different pieces, as people are probably, probably know, and also it tends to be a single point of failure and a single performance bottleneck. But notice that we're talking that where we are right now in our evolution is we're at that starting phase, and none of these problems are our problems yet. Does it make sense? These are all problems that at, that will happen as the team grows, uh, uh, the team and the product grow overall uh, uh, over the long term. But these are not problems that we typically have when we're starting out. Okay. So, and the other sort of aspects here are trying to figure, trying to make sure that we are not spending our time. We're spending our time building the minimal amount of technology that we need to meet the problem, uh, rather than building other technologies that are more general. So I strongly recommend that we uh, try to leverage as much as possible cloud infrastructure and cloud services. A bunch of the places that I've worked for recently have no physical infrastructure on the planet. Both Stitch Fix and WeWork are physical businesses, you know, as their actual job. Um, but they have no physical compute infrastructure anywhere. They do everything in the cloud. Um, I strongly, particularly at this phase, try to prefer using open source technologies as much as possible. Usually they're better than the commercial alternatives, but also they give us a lot of flexibility to try to figure out what we, uh, what we need to do going forward. Um, and again, spending, spending let, don't, not spending our time building out services that other people do as their jobs. So um, I strongly recommend at this phase leveraging somebody else's logging infrastructure, somebody else's monitoring, somebody else's alerting, um, trying to leverage other you know, third-party payment infrastructure, billing, fraud detection, all these kinds of things that are not the core competency of my business, I should absolutely be uh, delegating and paying somebody else to do. Uh, and so, you know, the, the insight here, and it's pretty obvious, is at this phase in particular, we should be focusing on our core competency, and anything that's not our core competency, we should be deferring or, or um, delegating to someone else. Cool. So uh, that was the starting phase. Now I want to talk about the scaling phase. And uh, I feel like I should continually, rem I'm going to do this a bunch of times, continually remind us that not every company or product is going to be ever in this scaling phase. But if you are, here are some ways to notice it, and here are some things that you can do about it. Um, so at this scaling phase, we're rapidly growing more and more and more teams. So we went from one team to many, um, and hopefully we now have some more runway. So we, instead of uh, only having a few months of runway, maybe we have six months or 12 months ahead of time. So it does make sense for us to, at this at this phase to invest in things that are going to um, help us be successful in the future. Um, so the key question is how to recognize when we go from that starting phase into the scaling phase. I get this question a lot. When should we think about migrating to fancier techniques? Um, I have found a couple of patterns in companies I've worked for and companies I've worked with. Um, the first one of those is uh, what I'll call velocity. So how fast are we able to move? Um, and a lot of times, you know, people who've worked in uh, monoliths for a long time, sometimes the, uh, your development velocity used to be fast and then it slows down for, uh, more and more. Um, and so if you're noticing your time to market slowing down, even though you have more people and more stuff to do, that's a good indicator that maybe your architecture needs to change. Um, another equivalent way to look at it is if you have different teams that are working together and they're not able to work independently because they're sort of coupled uh, to each other, they're stepping on each other's toes by the work that they're doing, that's, an that's another kind of uh, indicator. Another third one is if you find it really difficult to onboard new engineers and make them productive, um, that's an indicator that the, uh, maybe the architecture is too, uh, too coupled. So if you can get engineers up and running in a week or two, then you're doing great. If it takes two months, three months, six months before they're able to really be fully productive, um, that's an indicator that you might, uh, you might think about a re-architecture. Um, 
another uh, another problem that you might uh, see here is a simply a scaling problem where uh, your monolith is you know you try to vertically scale the monolith as much as possible and that is you're sort of running out of gas this absolutely happened at uh, eBay and at Amazon and at Twitter all those examples that I that I gave um, also Netflix also Google like all the places you can name have uh, have hit both the velocity problem and the scaling problem and also if you find that parts of the system need to scale faster than other parts um, that's a good indicator um, these typically one or both of these tend to be the sort of first uh, first order reason why people think about rearchitecture um, the 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 one that's like rarely anybody's first uh, first reason, but often a secondary reason is this idea of deployment independence, where some parts of the system need to be deployed independently of other parts, or maybe that monolithic release is too slow. Um, that's another another good indicator. So again, I just want to uh, want to uh, uh, remind everybody that maybe one percent of all the applications or companies in the world are in this uh, in this full scaling phase. Cool. Um, so what would a scalable architecture look like? So our goal here is to, this, our business is growing really rapidly, our team is growing rapidly, and we just wanna stay ahead of that. Uh, keep the site up, keep, uh, keep us uh, productive and moving forward. So what we're trying to do here is scale the teams, we're trying to scale the technology, uh, and we're trying to start to introduce repeatable processes to make that more efficient and more productive. Um, so rather than having one pizza, t one two pizza team, maybe we ha now have many two pizza teams, each of which are responsible for some particular area of our of our product or our company. Um, and I find it most uh, the companies that have done this well have aligned those teams around particular areas of a business, so align them around a particular business problem. Um, and typically those teams are responsible, those individual teams are responsible for a single application or service or maybe a set of related applications or services. So this is what the organizational infrastructure should look like at this, at this phase. Cool. So the scale, so rather than um, technologies that optimize for uh, initial productivity and for prototyping. Now we're uh, often, I see companies introducing more scalable enterprise technologies. So maybe they're migrating to Go or the JVM languages, and they're starting to think a lot more about latency and performance rather than simply about developer productivity. Um, and by the way, these problems were not problems we had earlier. So it was absolutely right for us not to think about them earlier and only to think about them now. And so now I see com companies in this phase start to uh, think about breaking out parts of the infrastructure, you know, payments, et cetera, into separate services um, rather than keeping everything in the monolith. Um, and then they start to introduce uh, and rely on more what I'll call fit for purpose systems. So rather than running your analytics against the production database, maybe you start to introduce an analytic system, which is more appropriate for that, rather than running search things against your production regular database you start to introduce a search engine you know these are the kinds of things that we do at this phase um, and this is the phase where we typically introduce something uh, like microservices which you know allow those individual teams to be separable from each other but but uh, have their efforts be able to be combined so to me a microservice is you build something it's single purpose it has a simple well-defined interface and it's modular and independent, which allows us to combine things together into a larger system. Um, and so as with the monolithic architecture, this microservice architecture also comes with a bunch of trade-offs. So what's one of the things that's nice about it is each of those individual units is independently or is individually simple. Um, and it allows us to independently scale those individual services. Um, Typically, it allows us to independently deploy those services from each other. So I can deploy one of the services rather than deploying all of them together. Um, it allows us to choose the optimal technology stack. So in a monolith, we all have to choose one technology stack, essentially. Um, and now we at least have the option, if, it, if for whatever reason it's better, to choose maybe a different technology stack for particular parts of the, of the, of the system. And also I think less well appreciated uh, is individual services can be their own security boundaries. So rather than having to secure some monolith that does our entire application, the particular areas that are about user privacy or about managing money, um, all those, those things, uh, those separate parts of the system can have 
more security uh, uh, put on them rather than um, trying to secure the entire tire system all together. Um, but there are cons to this. We uh, rather than because even though each unit is simple, we have now multiple cooperating units. Uh, we exchange those in-process latencies for network latencies, um, so we have to be more careful about not being so chatty. Um, we, because we don't have one thing, we have many things, we have to typically have more sophisticated deployment and monitoring tools. And overall, at least from a boxes and lines drawing an architecture perspective, we have, uh, we have more complexity. Um, so I'm recognizing that we're nearing the end, so I'm gonna just be very brief, talk very briefly about this last phase and then, uh, and then we'll do some questions. So the last phase is what I'll call the optimizing phase. So this is where the growth has uh, flattened out. Uh, and so maybe where we used to have a lot of teams, maybe we're starting to think about being more efficient and having fewer, uh, fewer teams managing the situation. Uh, we probably uh, though have a longer time horizon. So it seems likely that uh, maybe we'll be around for uh, more than 12 months, maybe two years or five years or something like that. Um, and so what does the architecture look at this like at this phase? So we have, we're trying to take what was a fast growing system, we're trying to turn it into a stable system that's efficient and sustainable to manage. So we're looking at making, making sustainable incremental improvements to functionality, sustainable improvements in technology efficiency, whether that's in terms of people or in terms of uh, machine resources. And we're thinking about trying to consolidate the teams so maybe those other people can start to work on the other new products that are in the starting phase or in the scaling phase. Um, so we talked very briefly uh, about all these different uh, all these different phases, the idea phase, the starting phase, the scaling phase, and then the optimizing phase. So uh, what I'd like to leave you with is there's nothing wrong with uh, changing the architecture over time. In fact, every successful company at a large scale that I can think of does not have the same architecture today as they had when they started. So the the flip way that I like to think about it is if you don't end up regretting your early technology decisions, you probably over engineered. So it's very possible that there was another company in 1995 when Amazon and eBay started that instead of building a monolith and meeting their near term customer needs, instead they built some big distributed system. Now, there's a reason why we've never heard of that company, right? If they spent their time building a distributed system rather than meeting customer needs, they died and they deserve to die. It's the, it's the team, it's the companies that focused on what they needed in the near term now and slowly over time evolved their architecture to be more, to go, to get bigger and bigger. Those were the companies that succeeded and became the ones that we know very well. So thank you very much.